Okay, let's get started. So, welcome back everyone to our analysis using our course. And for the afternoon session, we are going to be looking into dimensionality reduction. And um, my name is Chaitra. I am working as a bioinformatics specialist at Kremble. Uh, I have a bit of background in biology, bioinformatics, software programming, and currently I am working on looking at correlations between transcriptomics and electrophysiological properties in certain neurological diseases. So today, what we're going to be doing is trying to understand what dimensionality reduction is, why do we even need it, and we're going to learn a little bit about different types of methods for doing this dimensionality reduction. And just to get things started with what it even means, it is uh, the method for transforming your data, which has a lot of variables, like we saw in the morning, um, to a few variables, which explain the most differences in your observations. Okay, we are going to break down every part of it. We are going to explain what it means. So just to give an overview, this is what our afternoon is going to look like. So to understand what dimensionality reduction is, we are going to look at an example data and define these terms, what a dimension is, what a variable is, what samples are, and how can we even reduce it? And why do we need to reduce it? So let's go back to the example data, similar to what you were working on in the morning lab. So we had a mouse data set, right? Similarly, I'm showing you a sample of that. So you have two different genes that you've measured in six mice. So you have two genes and six mice. So in terms of the Terminology for dimensionality reduction, you would say your genes are variables and your mice are your samples. So basically, what are you measuring? You're measuring the gene expression that becomes your variable. And where are you measuring it in? Are you measuring it in cell lines? Are you measuring it in mice or some culture? So that becomes your samples. So uh, this is something that you would frequently encounter in omics. Um, some other examples uh, of biological data would be, you know, in, instead of genes, you're measuring protein expression or in, in different cell lines. Or if you want to go into a non-omics, um, you can have like uh, scores of students in different subjects, math, science. And uh, can anybody tell me in this protein example, what would be my variables and what would be my samples? Protein and one and protein two are what? Sorry. Correct. So you what are you measuring your proteins? So they'll be your variables. So your samples in this data set would be the cell lines, right? Okay. Similarly. In the, the third table, what would it be? What are your variables there? Yeah, the math and science, the subjects are, in, are the variables and the students will be your samples. So the dimensionality reduction as a concept is something that is applicable to different disciplines. That's why we're looking I'm just giving you a flavor of what kind of data it might be useful for. It's not just in genomics, but also outside biology, you have, you have a lot of applications for PCA. So going back to the simple gene expression data, so you have measured two genes and six different mice. How do we visualize it, right? Okay, let's start with gene one. So I have a simple axis the one line, and on that, I'm just plotting the different 
values of genes that I've measured on this line. So for example, can you see my one? Yeah, there you go. So for example, gene one has expression of 12 for mouse one. Say this is zero on the scale, and here it goes all the way to 15, for instance. This is mouse one. This would be mouse two. This point here is mouse three and so on, right? So when you have one gene measured in how many other samples you are working on, it's easy to put it on one line and see, you know, oh, out of my samples, okay, these three guys are on the lower expression. These three guys are on the higher expression, right? Let's add the second gene that we measured. So the moment we add the second gene, it's not one line anymore. It becomes two lines, two axes. So in other words, your variables, the genes that you're measuring, become these axes or dimensions. So like Shraddha explained in the morning, I'm just getting, yeah. So gene one for mouse one, as an expression of 12, so that would be somewhere towards the right side. And for um, gene 2, it has an expression of 8, so that would be somewhere around here. Somewhere around here. Let's say gene uh, for mouse 6, um, gene 2, sorry, gene 1 is 1. And Gene, sorry, gene one is two and gene two is one. So it's on the closer to the bottom left side of the graph. So if you put all the other mice on the graph, you have like three of them coming here, three of them going here. Do you follow so far? Okay. So let's increase the complexity of the data set. So gene three. So the moment we add gene three, what happens? There's a new axis in the picture. So you have one, two, and now you have a third arm. So the, and again, you can plot the values, whatever you have. And the thing is with how we as humans visualize um, gene expression or just visualize things, our brains cannot comprehend beyond three dimensions. So if you add four genes, 100 genes, 1,000 genes, you cannot visualize them on a screen, on a paper, or anything. So that's why we need to do dimensionality reduction. Um, and we know, as biologists here, that there are about 20,000 genes in the, that are expressed. And a typical size of our data sets would have 20,000 rows, like we learned about in the morning. So how do you visualize that? You do what is called dimensionality reduction. So you're going to transform the data into a few new variables, which going, uh, is going to explain the most differences in your observation. So uh, we're going to see which variables contribute to the most variation in your data, and how does this method capture it. Any questions so far? Okay. So you said that you know uh, if you were plotting genes on three different axes. So I mean gene one on X axis of the that we have its own markings, right? Yeah. X and then Y. Yeah. Okay. And then but then why is it not you need to plot them on this axis, you know? you can view the expression of the changes in the Yeah, but if you have it for hundreds of patients, then what are you going to do? Are you going to be scrolling through the Excel sheet? No, we are here to learn about R. We are going to use programming to make it easier for us to understand. And also this gene expression example is just a way to introduce dimensionality reduction as a concept. Right, uh, it's an example through which you can understand how you find variances in your data. So one thing we discussed about in the morning was batch effects. So 
PCA is something that will help you to identify what these batch effects are. So PCA is one of the methods that is uh, very frequently used uh, for dimensionality reduction. And it is part of the exploratory data analysis pipeline that Shraddha taught you in the morning. Right, it's not an independent standalone method that's going to answer all your questions. It's part of your workflow. You're going to see what the variation is. You're going to make inferences about it and use it to guide your next steps of the workflow. So, so yeah. So say, let's say for example, we have this data set. We have, let's deal with two variables at the moment. So you have variable one on the x-axis, variable two on the y-axis, and you have your different observations plotted in this sort of a scatter manner, okay? If you were to find one sort of, if you have to draw one line through these data that explains most variation, where would you draw the line? Can, can you take a guess? So you can have any line, right, like that this at any angles. So you have, you're free to choose. That way, as in, let me see if I can get my pen. So this way, let's say this way, you can draw this, you can draw this. So I'm gonna call the line one, two, three. And there's a fourth line, so four. What would you pick? Two? Why? Yeah. Does, does everybody else agree? Yeah. So what PCA does is, let me just, uh, Uh, do you know how I can clear off the uh, lines here? I think pointer options, I can just yeah, erase it. Oh. It is all in God's slide. Perfect. Yeah, got it. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So, we think that the line through about like the 45 degree angle explains the most variance through it. So what so what what does variance mean? It's it's basically the spread of your data, right? Like how much is my variable varying? What is the range that it is varying in? So what PCA does is it it finds um This axis over here. So if you see the data along this, you can see that the most of the spread is along the line that is going 45 degrees, right? And by definition, it, it tries to find other axes that are par uh, perpendicular to it. So all the new axes that it finds are going to be all orthogonal to each other. So basically, it's going to just rotate your data into newer axes or newer dimensions so that you can see that the most variation is along which of these new axes, right? So the direction along which there is most variation that is here, you see the spread along here is much more than the spread along here, right? So this, the first axis where the most variation is, that is going to be called the first principal component. And the second principal component is the one with the second highest variance, right? So this is PC1 and this is PC2, right? So your data is now just rotated. Uh, you, have, you had variable one and two like this, and now the principal component is just 
rotated the data. So you can see how the spread is going. Okay. So on the back end, so the math, well, we're going, not going to go into a lot of details about the map. We are going to really conceptually understand how dimensionality reduction works. So the mapping is done onto newer axes through certain matrix uh, operations. And the data is projected. So for instance, if you see this particular point, which was here, so that is projected onto the new axis like so, like a perpendicular one. So what was um, value say uh, two or two comma five is now a different value in a newer axis. Does it make sense? I think once we see more examples with the data, it's going to become more clearer, okay? So in terms of the terminologies, so when you, um, when the amount by which the data gets rotated, that's called loading values. They're basically correlations between the original values and the new, new values, okay? Okay, so just to recap, we had original observations like this. We did rotation. We found new pr principal components. We see that along principal component one, there is most variation and principal component two, there is uh, the second highest variation. And this I'm showing, you know, as visually um, how the new axis is, looks like. It's, I've just rotated it. Uh, it's it's uh, rotated. I'm just bringing back to uh, our usual convention. So we see how the data went from here to there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we're not going to be plotting 20,000 dimensions. That was just an example to... No, no, no. Yeah, but we when we visualize, we are going to visualize two at a time. We are going to visualize principal component versus two. We can do principal component one versus three or two versus three and so on. So say you have... So... That's what it's going to find the variation in the data. And it's going to look at the axis which represents the most variation in the data. Yeah, and the second va highest variance will be the second principal component. Um, and um, so um, if we have a data with 100 dimensions, for example, uh, it it will find you hundred new dimensions. So the maximum number of principal components that you can have is the same as the dimension of your data. So if you have hundred variables, hundred dimensions, so you have hundred new principal components. Twenty thousand dimensions, twenty thousand uh, principal components. But you'll see that the variation that the for, uh, uh, that each component explains is going to reduce as you increase the number of dimensions. Say the first one can explain, say, 90% of the variation in your data. Second one would be about five. The next one would be three or 0 0.3 and so on. So it's going to drop drastically as you go along. Um, and another property you should keep in mind is the total uh, uh, variance that explains, whether it's 100 dimensions or 20,000, the total is going to be 100, it's 100%. So it's, uh, you start with 95, so you add up all the variations, it, it, should, it should come up to 100, okay? Okay, so I briefly mentioned that it has applications in both omics and non-omics context. 
Um, to give us some examples of the non-omics context, it's very, very widely used in image compression, finance, uh, and pattern recognition. Like you all use like fingerprint sensing on, on your phones, right? So what it does is like, uh, first the image is captured of all the whole fingerprint, but the way that data is sort of compressed into unique features of your fingerprint into that is going from all the data to most uh, fewer data that represents your fingerprint uniquely, right? That is stored and that how they go from that to fewer information is through principal component analysis. It's just so that, you know, you don't, uh, you can kind of store, uh, save on storage by you know, saving uh, data in a much compressed format, but still identify how unique you are, right? That's uh, one thing. And yeah, it shows you what the dominant structure of your data is. You can identify batches, certain effects that you weren't aware of before. And it's very, very commonly used in machine learning for uh, reducing features so that you can build models on, a, on, on fewer, using fewer features. So in terms of um, how you can do this in R, we'll be using a function called PRCOM, right? So, so it's very quite straightforward to run it. So we're just going to run PRCOM on the mouse expression data set that we explored in the morning. Uh, this is just going to be uh, an overview of what the lab is going to look like. We will follow the lab in very detail uh, in the next session. So don't worry about it. So, um, so when you run PR comp on the mouse expression data, you're going to get an output. We are going to store it in PC out. And if you look at the structure of uh, PC out, how can you see what is in the output? What function would you use? Sorry, louder, please. STR structure, yeah. There's also a function summary that, that we can explore the output with, yeah. Yeah, so when we do the STR on the principal component, so what does it look like when you run a principal component analysis on a gene expression data? So you're gonna have like five different five different outputs so we'll we can see what the standard deviation of every principal component is uh, what the loading values are loading values again are the correlation between the old and the new component and these are some things you should keep in mind because these are going to be handy for our visualization later uh, and then there is a score matrix um, and what the first thing that you want to know after you run a PCA is what is the variance being explained? What's the most variance being explained by my first principal component? And what's the next one? And so on. So if you look at the summary of it, it you're going to get a table, something like this. So on this, you have standard deviation, proportion of variance, and cumulative proportion. And in terms of the columns, uh, can anyone tell why there are six columns? Six variables, that's right, yeah. So um, this is the standard deviation from principal component one, that is 5.5. Then, like I mentioned, it's going to reduce 1.7, 1.5, and so on. So this was the most variance that was present in the data. And that's why the first axis is through um, uh, is, is showing the maximum variance, uh, make maximum standard deviation. Okay, so mathematically, both standard deviation and variance are connected, right? So if you you can calculate one with the other, right? So it's it's telling you what the proportion of variance is. So first principal component. So it's uh, you should read it as you should 
sort of mentally multiply it with 100 uh, in order to kind of compute the percentage of it, right? So this is telling me that the first principal component is going to explain 82.4% um, of variation in the data, right? Similarly, if you do that for EC2, that comes down to 8.2, right? And then 6.6 uh, .6 and so on. So if you sum all this up, it should come down to 100, right? Um, so what this cumulative proportion is, that is uh, just adding, um, so for instance, so this is 0.84, uh, 824. The uh, cumulative proportion here is the sum of uh, this one and this one. So it's 0 0.8 plus 0 0.08. Uh, it comes down to 0 0.9. And this is the sum of these three. This is the sum of these four and so on. So it's just the sum of the previous uh, values. So that's why you see the last column, the cumulative proportion is one or 100%, right? Okay, uh, just going to give a flavor of what kind of plots you can make with it. You're going to be making this uh, with me during lab. So like I said, one of the first things you would look at is the proportion of variance, the variance explained by every principal component. And you might have seen like bar plots like this one. So um, that tells you, you know, um, so for uh, this is, this is telling you for dimensions on the x-axis and the percentage explain, uh, variance explain on the y-axis. And, and like we talked before, it's just the second row of this table, the proportion of variance multiplied by 100, yeah? So you have 82% and the next is 8.2%. See, the values are same as above, yeah? 6.6% over here and so on. So if I sort of um, trace the bar graph and it'll sort of draw a line uh, through every you know uh, value of variance, I'm going to get a line something like this. So this plot, you know, with the bar and this line is called a scree plot. So it kind of looks like, you know, what uh, you might have seen um, by like cliffs, where you have this sort of a rocky formation. It kind of looks like that. So it's named scree plot. So this is useful to select the number of dimensions. So the, the whole point of re reducing it so that we can select fewer features uh, and see what the variation is, isn't it? So that you do by looking at where this sort of drop occurs. You know, you're going from maximum to low. And this is called the elbow of the plot, like the elbow of the plot. So people usually sort of visually look at it and see where this elbow is and say, okay, um, if it's it's only three dimensions are explaining my most variance, I'm going to select only these three features uh, and I'm going to keep away the others. So in this particular example, the most variation is the first dimension, but we're not not really going to reduce this data set, our gene expression with data set. It's just a, it's just a, um, an example to understand it conceptually, right? Any questions so far? Is it all clear? Or are you all just sleepy after lunch? <laughs> sleepy, I guess, yeah. Okay. Yeah, again, don't worry, we are going to do all these plots and all the other exercises again. So this is just, uh, see, just, you know, this is just what you're going to be expecting, that's all, okay? Um, for scatter plot, again, we're going to go back to the output that we got. Um, so that, um, from the uh, output of principal component analysis, the PR comp, you're, you're going to select different, um, uh, 
variables within the output to plot different aspects of it. So one thing we can plot was the maximum variances. The next is to see the new axis on the new axis, that is principal component one, dx, versus principal component two on the y. How do my, my data look like? Where do they fall? So on the outright, you see that there are three mice over here, and there are three mice clustering over here, right? And then what's the obvious question? What are these mice and why are they clustering like this, right? So if I add label to them and color them, I see that, you know, they coming from different origins. Some are mesodermal, some are neuroplast. And that kind of explains why these samples are getting separated this way, right? Similar to how the clustering example we did in the morning, yeah? So this kind of a score plot or a scatter plot, you do with the X, the the uh, score matrix, that is the new components or the values in the new axis, right? Um, and the third plot that you can uh, look at is something called the pi plot. It's a bit loaded, this slide, but I will walk you through it. Um, so for a moment, we're going to switch to a slightly different data set. Um, this is a data set called the IRIS data set. You might have heard or worked with it, maybe in uh, intro class. So it's basically they are uh, measuring different uh, plants, I suppose, or flowers. Um, so you have different um, of these plants um, on or as the rows there. So they are your variables. So yeah, they've measured like the sepal length, the width, the petal length, petal width, and what species that they are, right? So it's similar to our mice data. We had genes, and we had mice, but instead you have different plants and different properties of these plants, right? So, um, so you have like uh, uh, values, that that range in the like on the order of five for sepal length, like about three for sepal width, and so on. So when I've run PCA on it, I'm just showing you how this new score matrix and the loading matrices look like. Right? I told you that with score matrix you can make uh, your scatter plot, and with uh, variances you can make the scree plot. Right? So what does your by plot do, right? This over here is the scatter plot. The, the dots that you see are the scatter plot that were sort of made from this X way, right? From the output of PCA. So this was the score matrix after PCA and you had the um, score plot. The So, with the loading matrix, that was the rotation variable here, you can draw these, um, you can look so the loading. So loadings are just um, associations between your principal components and your uh, original variables. So here, it's telling me that sepal length can be represented as uh, 0.5 times principal component one or point minus 0.37 times principal component two. So that means just imagine them as two axes, PC1, PC2. Sepal length would be you know, 0.5 on the PC1, so this, this arm, and minus 0.3 on this arm. So that will be somewhere on the negative scale, right? So that's why, so if you look at this arrow over here, the um, sepal length, sepal length over here. So it's going on the bottom right quadrant. So if you imagine like a line zero, zero and zero, zero, it's going over here, right? Right, so this is, uh, and if you do that for the other variables, other of the original variables, you see lines like, uh, these drawn for the, the variables. So 
Bio plot is basically some uh, combination of the scatter plot and your uh, axis in the new dimension. So what it's going to tell me is, sorry, in this example, sepal width is you're going to you can see how similar these variables are. For instance, the petal length and width are very close to each other. The lines are almost overlapping. So um, so they are very close to each other. For instance, and the sepal width is completely different from the other three. So if I kind of take all these four different properties that that, that were measured, the sepal width alone sort of uniquely identifies every observation. So that is what is explaining the most variation. The most differences between these flowers or leaves are coming from sepal width. Not so much between petal length and petal width, but both sepal length. Next to our variation is coming from sepal length. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So just to recap the figure part, you can look at maximum variances through this by plot, uh, sorry, through this uh, bar plot or squee plot. Then you can look at your data in new dimension, and then you can sort of put together uh, the scatter plot and uh, see how correlated these variables are. All right. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So we have looked at what PCA does, how we can do it in R with PR pump, and how we can visualize this. Three ways to visualize it, right? Um, next, we are going to move on to other methods of dimensionality reduction. So what we, we are going to cover PSNE and UMAP. So these two methods, both TSNE and UMAP, are what is something called um, for uh, nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So it, it, what does that mean? It's so for PCA example, we try to draw a line through the data, right? So we try to uh, find a straight line through our data that explains maximum variance. But TSNE is, or, or both TSNE and UMAP are meant for data that cannot be separated by a straight line. Uh, so I'll show you an example. This is very common TSNE, especially in uh, single cell uh, applications. So I'll show you an example where the both PCA was applied and then TSNE was applied, and you can see how uh, uh, the two methods separate your uh, variables, right? So TSNE stands for T stochastic neighbor embedding. It's uh, a mouthful. But conceptually, again, it, it, it tries to find new variables that represent your data um, by preserving neighborhood. So you can imagine it like a graph, like, like, um, like a network, like you have one data point, two data points. Uh, it tries to find, you know, through Euclidean uh, distance type of measures, how close are two points in the multidimensional space. So, and it does, and it kind of tries to find um, um, these, uh, uh, what is the closest neighbor to this point? What is the next closest neighbor? And groups the data so that you can uh, reduce from these 1,000, 10,000 dimensional to two dimension. So going from multidimension to two, how close are these two? points. So um, it, um, how can I represent two points from a multidimensional space in, in two-dimensional space as a neighbor, right? It's sort of a graph-based way that it does like an iterative approach. It's quite time-consuming. Um, and it's really, really great for visualizing single-cell RNA-seq data. Um, and one thing is uh, this algorithm it does it in a random manner, what Shraddha mentioned in the morning. So it's random in a statistical sense. It's not random in a colloquial sense, what we would say. So what that means is you run TSNE, you visualize, you get some pretty colorful pictures. But the next time you run TSNE, 
the graph is going to look different. So every time it's going to do this iterative grouping of data. So it's going to put these points in a slightly different place. But if, if it finds data observation one and two as neighbors, those two relationships will still be the same in the new graph, right? It's just going to, it may be here in the first time, and it might just get shifted anywhere else, right? So this is something um, that is sort of unique to TSNE. And the way you can uh, stay consistent is by setting something called random C. I think Shraddha mentioned in the morning, you tell the algorithm, you start at this place every time. You can set in our random seed. That way you make sure that your plots are sort of reproducible. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so basically the difference between TSNE and uh, PCA would be that PCA looks for variance, variance in the data, and TSNE looks at this neighborhood information. Right. Um, and this is the example I was talking about. So this is a single cell data set. Uh, and when they uh, tried to run a PCA, this was what the plot looked like. And uh, you see that the color sort of correspond to whether the neurons were inhibitory or excitatory. So if you have warm colors like pink and red, so the, those would be inhibitory neurons, cold colors like blue or green, they are excitatory neurons. Uh, and brown or gray are your non-neural uh, cells like microglia, astrocytes, and so on, right? So you see that even though they were colored by different cell types, you know, inhibitory neurons is a broad term. It has many, many subcategories within it. So it, the PCA was not able to separate the data very well. But if you look at TSNE, you have these very, very pretty colorful uh, plots where you know every color sort of corresponds to specific uh, neuronal cell type. So um, that's why um, uh, this is very popular among single cell uh, data analysis pipelines. Um, so in terms of like how you can do it in R, it's a very very simple function called TSNE. It's part of this package TSNE. Um, and one parameter you would keep in mind is perplexity. Um, that just um, relates to how um, to balance the, the neighborhood versus global uh, structure. What I mean by this is it's better to look at it visually. So if you change this perplexity, say from 100, the 10 to 100, you can see that, you know, there's one cluster here, this red and blue are close together. But as you increase this value, it sort of becomes more distant to each other. Although I think we can go higher up to see better separation at this point. Yeah. Significance in the what do you mean, like? Right, right. So I mean, I think with this specific example, we are again still working with the mouse gene expression. So. It's not the best one to demonstrate TSNE with. Ideally, it would be uh, good to do it with a single cell uh, data set. So I think, um, Shraddha or Ian, you guys are more experienced with the single cell. Uh, are there may, uh, any measures to uh, determine the separateness of the clusters with TSNE? Yeah, I think he's asking about the goodness of um, this per perplexity parameter. Like, that's like we're making the figure looks nicer, like more separated, but like in terms of how that is reflected in the sample, are they really truly different or not? Like how we felt in terms of like stats. 
Yeah, um, I think one is just the way the kind of the biology really comes to know how you really. So I mean, I'm just going to take like a bit of a example, which is uh, um, um, in terms of, you know, when you cluster your, your different single cells together, you can have sort of background knowledge of what your sort of cell types are. Uh, and the other, other aspect of that as well is sort of like how, how detailed is that cluster information to be like well. So are you kind of just looking at general cell types like you know, just not cell types or just have to look at Uh, so that's one way. The other, um, in terms of how cells are clustered, I think one way to check is more the cells would do like a different sort of selection on the clusters. But you can start to see what genes are getting distressed. You know, just look at your genes if those clusters are sort of matching the biology. So if your T cell are expressing these organic markers, if your T cell are expressing these in those systems. Yeah. With single cell, uh, at, uh, for every cell type, so on this plot, every point on the plot of, a, of, of this one, for example, every point here is a cell, right? So you can look at what genes are being expressed for that cell. And say within a cluster, you have, um, you expect a certain marker, but there are a couple of cells in that cluster which don't express. That kind of tells you that, you know, the, the, this should be a bit more refined than what my graph currently looks like. So you go back and uh, play with the parameters, regenerate it. So it's, a, it's an iterative process. So, and the last one we look at where, um, is the method called UMAP. It's uni it stands for uniform, uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. So this is also uh, similar to, very similar to TSNE. It uh, also is very applicable for data that cannot be separated by straight lines. So this is also a non-linear dimensionality reduction method. Um, and the difference with TSNE is that it's computationally more efficient, right? It also focuses on the neighborhood. So, um, but the runtime when you run it on your computer, it's going to be much faster. So one example is like there was a, a comparison on, on the same data set. It had 700 dimensions. So when they ran TSNE, it took 27 minutes. When you ran UMAP on it, it was much, much lesser. So um, in terms of if, if the data set is really, really big, this is a better option to choose when you want to do the dimensionality reduction. Um, and also it sort of preserves these global data structure better. So what I mean by that is if there are similar cell types, as in um, belong to um, uh, similar groups, you see them more closer, but also separate, well separated than TSNE would. So it might, TSNE might put them all in one group. This might show you more finer separation. Um, and yeah, in terms of how you would do it in R, it's a function called UMAP, part of a package called UMAP. And yeah, we'll see in the labs what UMAP does and what, how do you plot UMAP? So 